all hear me? Okay. So um, tonight, as we were talking about the chat or talking beforehand the meeting, um, we're going to be learning about the native bees of Arizona. And uh, this is a topic that I have a lot of personal interest in. So I'm really excited about this, but I'm sure a lot of others are too. Um, Arizona is home to an astounding diversity of bees with well over 1200 species. It is arguably the most bee diverse region on the globe. Arizona's native plants depend on this bee diversity for their pollination. Um, and many of Arizona's bees are specialist pollinators. Some of them are rare or limited in their range. And unfortunately, native bees are in decline. But fortunately, the causes of this decline are within our control. This presentation will introduce Arizona's native bees, highlight some of the bees most important to pollinating Arizona's native plants, and explain the challenges they face and the ways that we may protect them. Our presenter, Catherine Busby, is a PhD candidate in entomology and insect science at the University of Arizona. Previously, she earned bachelor's degrees, more than one, in ecology, evolution, and behavior, and also in studio art from the University of Texas at Austin. She is interested in protecting the diversity of native pollinators especially bees, through research and science communication and visualization. So please join me in welcoming Catherine. Thank you, Susie. <laughs> and thank Ken, I saw, I saw Ken on mute or on, go live with the video and clap, so thank you. Um, I'll, I'll attempt to share my screen and hopefully this will work out um, as intended. So Let me Remind the uh, participants, if you are not giving the talk, please mute yourselves so we don't hear your uh, can opener in the background while you feed your dog. And um, also, if you have questions, put them in the chat and we'll cover them at the end. Okay, great. Take it away, Catherine. Okay. Um, and if you, if you can't uh, see or hear anything, please do, you know, stop me and let me know. I'll try to save some time for questions at the end if I can, um, and and feel free to put them in the chat. I think that's our normal uh, procedure if you have a question in the middle. So um, first off, as uh, Susie kindly introduced okay. me, I'm, 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 I'm a PhD I'm candidate so in ecology and insect science. Mm -hmm. Uh, here at U of A. And I, uh, I love plants. I love to think about plants, but I'm almost certain that anybody who's in this room knows more about plants than I do. I'm usually thinking about plants in the context of the servers working And um, hold on just a second. Diane, would you mute yourself, please? I actually, I, I found out something cool that I'm a co-host and I just had the option to do that. I just like yeah, I was looking for that, but I didn't find it. So, okay. Sorry, Catherine, go ahead. I, I wasn't going to just do that, but it, it like popped up and it said, would you like to mute? So I did. But um, <laughs> so I, I actually have a question for the audience before we even get started, because this title slide. Oh, and actually, hopefully I'm sharing a full screen PowerPoint. Is that true? Yes, that's true. Okay, um, so that that title slide has a picture of a bee on it, which is an agapostamon bee but um, it's on a flower that I've, I've used in a talk in the past and the audience wanted to know what flower that was and I actually had no idea. So if any of you plant folks have a, an idea of what that is, I would love to know. So feel free to put that in the chat um, and then I'll, I'll tell people in the future. It's really a lovely flower, whatever it is. So um, anyway, so I will be talking about bees in the context of the plants that they pollinate, but that is uh, not my primary forte. So I'm, I'm happy for this to be a conversation between us if you wanna weigh in on the plant side. 
Um, so I'm going to just cover the, the native bees of Arizona in the context of plants, who they are. Some of them are common and widespread. Um, there are some that are that occur outside of our area, but all of them do occur here in addition to sometimes other places. Others are endemic here and they don't occur anywhere else. Some of them are um, generalist pollinators, but they also contribute to the pollination of our important, rare, native, unique plants of Arizona. Some bees um, that I'll mention are specialists on plants that are important in Arizona, and some of them are just weird uh, situations of bee life history or something that I thought was cool about an Arizona bee. So we'll talk about some of them. Um, and then there is unfortunately this perpetual issue of bee decline as well as plant decline and other organism decline that's just been a, a rampant problem. Um, so I'm, I'm going to mention that, but I, I think we've all kind of heard how dire things are and I, and I hope to be solution oriented. So I'm going to talk about things that I think could make a difference that really are hopeful for, um, for turning our, our situation around. Uh, and to start off, because I always, I always start by mentioning the fact that um, most people are thinking honeybees when they think bees. And when I'm talking about native bees, honeybees are not among them. Um, honeybees are by far the most famous bee, but they're a domesticated bee that was brought from Europe. Um, and previous to Europe, it was from Africa. And then there was a hybridization between bees imported directly from Africa and those di imported directly from Europe that took place in Brazil. And we ended up with Africanized honeybees, but all of those are Apis mellifera. And we don't actually have a native bee that was in the genus Apis, um, except actually for, for one. And the, so Apis mellifera is mainly here because it's pollinating our crops and we do depend on it. It's, it's a domesticated, um, farm animal, essentially. It's somebody earlier today called it the cow of bees. So um, I say the one exception is that back in the um, Miocene, I want to say, a long time ago, there was an apis bee, a honey bee that was native to North America, and it was apis nearctica. It was, it's known now only from um, fossils. So it it was here and it is no longer, it went extinct and then Apis was reintroduced. So um, other than that, that bee, Apis is not native. The other bee that people think of most of the time, I mean, I'm talking general public, I know we all know here that there's, there's a lot of bees, but um, the, the bumblebee is the other bee that most people just immediately think of when they think bee. And I use here the example of Bombus impatiens, um, which is also not native to our area. And it's, it's native to the East Coast and further North as well, um, but it, it's encroaching. It's, um, it's brought in again for agriculture. It's used in greenhouse commercial pollination. And so it, um, it is introduced to a lot of areas where sometimes it brings pathogens and parasites that are transmitted to native bees. Um, and sometimes it ends up becoming naturalized outside of its range. So it's not, um, I, it's not my favorite example of a bumblebee. And I, I know that uh, we have this song. I don't know if y'all are familiar with the song, I'm squishing up a baby bumblebee. I think that that is not a very good message to be sharing with our little kids about bumblebees um, and that we should squish them and that they're going to sting us. And I, I'm not gonna sing this song. So if you don't know it, just YouTube it. But, um, but the song has a line in it that says, I'm squishing up the baby bumblebee, ow, it stung me. And I just wanna um, point out that bumblebees are holometabolists. So they go through a series of life stages that are not um, similar to the adult life stage. So if you were to squish up a baby bumblebee, you would be squishing up a larva and it would not be able to sting you. So that song is not accurate. Um, but it does highlight some of the actually interesting life history of bumblebees. And they, they go through um, a series of larval instars 
during development, but the way they do it, I think is really cool. Uh, and, and bumblebees are, um, they're, they're kind of cold adapted. They're really fluffy. They're found often in Canada um, and they, they survive well where climates are cold. So you might uh, not be surprised that they're found in, in colder climates than here. And Bombus impatiens, like I mentioned, is not native. Um, however, we do still have bumblebees here in Arizona, just not Bombus impatiens, well, not intentionally Bombus impatiens. Um, so the, the Bombus life cycle that I mentioned, and this is a, a beautiful illustration by a local artist, Trenton Young. I, I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his last name right, but um, he's incredibly skilled. I've seen him, uh, I've met him and I've seen him do some sketching and he's just a very talented artist. Uh, and he drew this illustration for the Hollis Woodard lab. Um, but it's, it's showing how bumblebees um, start off with just one individual, a queen, who finds some cavity in the early spring, like a, a rodent burrow or something that's been like an abandoned cavity in the ground. And she begins hunting for pollen and nectar and she exudes wax from her body that she uses to make kind of a little pot. And in that pot, she puts nectar and pollen and she lays an egg. So uh, as the egg emerges, it, it develops through those larval instars, which Trenton has illustrated in the center of this image here from egg, larva, pupa to adult. And when the adult emerges, that is a worker bee. And that bee will start helping with nest construction. And both, both the females, the queen and this new worker bee will go foraging, build the nest and continue to uh, provision new cells and the queen will continue to lay eggs on them until she has kind of a little construction army and all the worker bees then put in their effort to building the colony up. Their numbers get to um, 50 to 100. And then they, um, later in the summer, they start producing males for the first time. The queen starts laying male eggs. And once there are males, males go off looking for mates and the queen starts laying queen eggs or um, eggs that are raised as queens. So new queens go out and they go and, and they mate. Um, and then right before winter, everybody dies, <laughs> except the new queens who hang out underground and they are ready to start the cycle over in the spring. So I just think that that bumblebee life history is an incredible story. And I'm happy to say that we do have uh, some really, really neat species of bumblebees, just a handful, but they're in our higher elevation areas um, of Arizona and uh, maybe higher latitudes as well. But in the Tucson area, they're in the Sky Islands and uh, they are uh, probably the easiest to find is Bombus sonoris. Um, this can be found at, at 4,500 feet, which is uh, a little under 1500 meters, I believe, in elevation. So at Gordon Hirabayashi, at um, Whipple Observatory, and maybe maybe Madera, uh, Madera Canyon. Um, these are generalist pollinators, but they do pollinate some of the some of the plants that are um, rare while they're at it. And they're pretty pretty big, bo uh, large bodied, so they can travel long distances and, and reach a lot of plants. And then my favorite bee is Bombus huntii, not my favorite bee of all, my favorite bumblebee. Um, this photo is from the University of Arizona uh, Insect Collection, Digital Commons. And this species, uh, this particular individual, I think the photo was taken on Mount Lemmon. And I've seen these bees on Mount Lemmon. Uh, they are, they're wonderful. They, they, come out when wildflowers are just exploding on top of the mountain and they're bumbling around as they do. So um, Bombus huntii is also in other areas. It's not only here, but I, I think it's a very cool example of a local bumblebee that does very well. Um, so I, I think sometimes about what makes those introduced species the Apis mellifera and Bombus impatiens so, um, so ubiquitous in our culture. And I think partly it's that we depend on them for things. And it's probably partly that they were brought from Europe where we had a lot of 
um, stories that ended up getting repeated here. Um, but I also wonder if there's an aspect of it that it's because they're social and we connect with that somehow. And I, it also means that they have, you know, more numbers. We see them in clusters, perhaps. And um, most bees are actually solitary. Most bees don't do that huge group thing. But there are a few that do not the same behavior, but uh, very strange versions of uh, eusociality. And um, I'll talk about some of them, but I, I, I want to point out the fact that what I talk about today is only going to be a tiny sliver of the bees that are out there. And there are 20,000 species of bees worldwide, 4,500 to 5,000 here in North America. 1200 to 1300 in our little niche of the woods, our neck of the woods in Tucson um, or in Arizona. And that actually makes us arguably maybe the most bee diverse place. And I know that in this group, we know there's a, just abundance of plants as well and, and a diversity of plants as well. And that you know would make sense that the bees and plants are both diverse. But um, actually deserts in general tend to be more diverse for all sorts of things. And if we're, if we're tied with any other place on earth for bee diversity, it would be the, the deserts of, uh, the around the Mediterranean, Israel, Turkey, um, and the Atacama Desert. So you know, dry places are, are diverse and, and especially if they have some topography and some colliding biomes like we do here. So um, to illustrate another way of looking at that diversity, there are seven families of bees worldwide. One of them, Stenotridae, is only located in Australia. So we, we don't have those. Um, another, Melididae, is only in, I think, Northern temperate areas and Africa. But we actually do have some molidity here in Arizona. We have a little, a little pocket and uh, we've got a, a few species, just a handful. So six of these families are present here. And you can see, <laughs> other than stenotridity, you can see any bee family you want to here in Arizona. And they all have incredibly stunning individual species within them. Uh, so I'll talk, about, I'll talk about some of those. But I alluded to, let's see, to some of the bees that nest solitarily and that are uh, social. And bees like this one, this is Diadasia rinconis, they nest in, um, in these aggregations. So if you are ever lucky enough to see a big flat area of the desert where there's just bare soil, but it's peppered with little tiny holes all over it about the size of a, a pencil eraser. And maybe with little turrets around them, you might be seeing an aggregation of Diadasia rinconis. And, it, and it's a very active center when it's active, but that is only a period of a couple of weeks out of the year. So Diadasia, um, and I'll explain this big ball of bees in just a second, but I'll go to my next slide. Um, Diadasia nests just during this two week window that I was talking about. And what happens is the males emerge first and they're ready to go before females emerge. So they're looking for brand new females to be coming out of these little, little uh, chimneys. And when the females emerge, the males kind of form this ball and they're all hoping to be the one that gets to mate with her. And only one of them will be lucky enough for that to happen. Um, but once the female is mated, she's going to forage for pollen. She's gonna provision a nest. She's going to lay eggs. And then that's the end of the season for those bees after about two weeks, those, those developing bees underground stay there for the entire rest of the year underground and you would never know they were there. Um, there's, there's even more interesting um, interactions that happen during that time. And one of them is a beetle pictured in the second image here. Um, it's a ripophorid beetle. 
and it's it's kind of a bee mimic. It, it looks like a weird beetle, but it, it sort of looks like a bee, but not quite. Um, and they are parasites of the bees. So they are into the nest whenever they can sneak in and not get caught. And they're, I believe, feeding on larvae. So um, they have to be active during that two week window as well. And something interesting about diadasia is that they're, they're oligolectic. So they have a narrow range of plants that they pollinate. They're, they're pretty specialist and they pollinate, depending on the diadasia species, either cactus, a puncha, or uh, sunflowers and asteraceae, or some of them visit Malvaceae and they specifically like the globe mallow or the Sphyrosia, um, desert mallows. So they are pretty unique to the Southwest. They go um, east to Texas, and I, I think they're probably in California as well, but they are, um, they're definitely Southwestern desert pollinating bees. And another bee that does an aggregation type of nesting behavior, mating behavior, is Centris pallida. This is a, a almost hauntingly beautiful bee. It's, it's like a silver, um, powdery gray. And the males, especially, I guess, maybe both sexes, but they have these green eyes that are immediately um, noticeable. If you catch one and kill it and try to put it in your collection, the green eyes will fade over time, unfortunately. And that's true of other bees with really colorful eyes. But um, Centris pallida is an oil collecting bee. And they have these structures on their legs that they use to collect oils. And they use those oils to um, attract females in a very interesting uh, mating behavior that's kind of similar to what diadasia does, where males are, are looking for females that have just emerged. But uh, what's interesting with Centris pallida, and a friend of mine, Megan Barrett, works on this system, is that there are two different types of males. Some of them are bulky, big males that are powerful, and they try to be the, you know, competitive ones, the first to mate, and they're trying to get into that bee ball and, and get the female. But there's a, a little male, another kind of male who's small, and he will just kind of hang back. And when the female manages to, uh, she, I guess, wants to get out of there and start foraging or something, I don't know, maybe she's hungry. But um, when she escapes and the, you know, the big males don't have a chance to mate, the little guy will be waiting off on the side and then he'll mate with her. So that's their, they have this kind of bimodal strategy that they use for mating. And it's, uh, it's pretty strange. And what my friend has looked at in her research is the fact that um, they are within two degrees Celsius of their thermal limit when they do that, because they're hovering above the ground, generating a lot of heat through flight in the hottest part of the summer in the desert. So it's pretty amazing that they're able to do that and survive. Um, and if you, uh, if you ever see an aggregation of Centris pallida, you might be a little bit startled because they generate a lot of noise. They're very fast flyers. And it would be easy to think that this was just a swarm of honeybees or something that would you know, want to hurt you. Um, these bees are frequent visitors to Parkinsonia, Palo Verde. And I'm not sure if that's because they're specialists or uh, if they just really like that plant for some reason, but they're found there foraging on that. And also on Carmaria, which makes sense because that's an oil producing plant and they, they go for oil. Um, I believe maybe they, I, I think that might be true of uh, creosote as well, but you all can correct me if I'm wrong about that. Um, I know that other bees that look for oil are also on creosote, which is why I think that. So that is Centris pallida, and we have uh, several species in the genus of Centris as well. And another bee that has a variety of nesting strategies, but which does do these aggregations that I'm talking about in, in a certain different context is Agapostamon. And this is also a bee that's very common and that's very stunning to look at. And I, I think um, maybe this is the most awe-inspiring. <laughs> that's a matter of opinion, actually. So I'm not sure what other people would think. But 
it's metallic green with stripes on its abdomen. It's just really showy. And what's surprising is that you can pretty much go to any um, flower patch during the right time of year in the, in the early summer and you can see these bees. So they're, they're not rare at all, but they're, they are gorgeous. Um, so I, I have an illustration that I got from a paper here that described the structure of their nest of, of a, a species um, called Agapostomon cockerelli that shows the fact that they have many, many nests going on um, from multiple females and they have a single entrance. So it's, um, this is an aggregation of a different kind because there's only one exit, but there are a lot of different families sharing. So I like to think of this kind of like the, I've never been to New York, but I understand that they have hotel, uh, apartment buildings there where you, you go in one door and then everybody's individual living unit is within a hallway. Um, so I, I think of that as this sort of situation. Uh, but there's others in the same genus that don't do that and that, um, that are either nesting individually or they might have a big nest like this where only one female did all those different little cells. Um, and I, I should also mention for context, that this is all underground and most bees do nest underground. That's the, the kind of most frequent nesting behavior that bees do, whether it's in the desert or anywhere. And this little bee um, is in the same tribe as Agapostamon. I can't be sure from the photo because it's a little bit too small to tell if it's Agapostamon or if it's another uh, Agachlora, Agachloropsis, or Agachlorella. And uh, this is in the larger group, the Helictidae, that are known as the sweat bees. And you might be familiar with them, especially the tiny little ones that we know of as Lazia glossum. They're called sweat bees because they'll land on you, like they, they landed on my thumb in this picture. And uh, I, I, so what they're doing is they're foraging for salts that come from your sweat and maybe, maybe they're getting some water, I don't know, but they, they wanna land on you and lick you. And <laughs> some people find that really disturbing. And some people claim that they do sting as well. I wonder if they're maybe nipping with their mandibles a little bit. I've never been stung by one, but I, I don't discount what people have told me. So I think maybe they do sometimes sting you a little bit. Um, and what really bothers people is that they'll often land on your head and crawl under your hair, um, kind of licking your scalp. And <laughs> it's just unnerving, but they're, they're abundant, they're beautiful, and they're generalist pollinators. So they're doing a good job of, of pollinating a lot of different things. And also because they're very small, the one on my thumb is kind of mid-size. And because they're very small, they'll sometimes pollinate the tiniest flowers. Um, Lacia glossum can be found pollinating just, um, I'm blanking on the name of this plant, but ask me later and I'll figure it out. It, it's tiny and you would wonder what pollinates it. Um, tiny low-lying mat-like plant. So uh, I guess, Partly here, I want to illustrate the size diversity of bees that can accomplish tasks like that. And then there are many bees that nest totally solitarily and that are also really unique around here. Xylocopa is a genus that's abundant worldwide. Um, but here in the Southwest, we have some species that are nowhere else. So in the top right here, we have uh, Xylocopa californica. And it's visiting creosote, which I believe is nectarless. So it must be foraging for oil or pollen, um, if I'm correct about that. And then this, uh, the one that's a little bit on the left is a male Xylocopa sonorina. And they are huge. They're, um, if you were to compare them to the bee that I just showed that was on my thumb, these males would be like the size of the first joint of my entire thumb. Uh, they are like a, you know, couple centimeters long or maybe an inch long. And they're just the golden snitch of the bees. And if you're familiar with Xylocopa veripuncta, that might be what you think of these bees as. It's the same bee. It's had a name change recently. So we're now calling it Xylocopa sonorina, the valley carpenter bee. And I think here this picture is kind of hard to see, but it looks to me like it's foraging on lantana. However, these bees are generalists 
and they can pollinate all sorts of things as long as those things are large enough for them to reach into. And they're uh, documented to have been pollinators for the di uh, Dichromanthus michoacanus, the uh, uh, something like the Lady of Michoacan orchid, which is a, a rare, it's an Arizona orchid. So um, along with bumblebees, I believe they're responsible for taking care of some of the pollination needs of this plant. So um, something interesting about the carpenter bees and the reason they're called carpenter bees is because of their nesting habit. They don't nest in the ground. They nest above ground in wood. And you may already know this if you've had them nest in your house or in a structure that um, you didn't want them to nest in. They do that sometimes, but it's because they have the strong mandibles to be able to chew into wood and excavate tunnels, which they then lay, they provision with pollen they lay eggs on the pollen and then they create these little wall partitions where they separate out individual larvae developing inside of, um, in this case, an inflorescent stalk of Dazzlerian wheeleri. Now they'll nest in pretty much anything that's soft enough, including styrofoam, including lead. But uh, here in the Southwest, in, in uh, I guess, less human populated areas, they really have three main choices, which are the Dazzlerian, the Sotols, Agaves, and um, Yuccas. And they always use the dried flower stalk. Uh, they, in, in town, if you've ever seen them in, within the city where we're at lower elevation, they'll sometimes use the soft fronds of palm trees, um, especially the ones that have been cut so that there's kind of a, an access point to the very soft, pithy interior of those dried palm fronds, but they have to be dried. And because carpenter bees have the ability to use their mandibles to cut, they also sometimes engage in nectar robbing. And they will cut a slit in the side of a tubular flower. Here, uh, I was gonna say Dazzler, it's desert willow. And they'll bypass the anthers and get nectar from inside the base of the um, flower so that they're not pollinating. And then even bees and other insects that can't cut a slit like that will access that same um, cut to, to reach the nectar without pollinating. So a big topic of conversation among ecologists looking at systems like this is what's the nature of the, um, the interaction between this plant and this bee? Are they mutually benefiting each other or is the bee accessing a, something that it benefits from without returning the favor? So in that case, this flower could be losing its nectar and losing also its chance at, pollin at being pollinated. Um, so it would really be a parasitic relationship in that case. And uh, it's, it's unclear whether the benefit of the bees being able to legitimately pollinate also offsets that, that robbing behavior that they do. So this is another large bee, Protoxia gloriosa. And um, I, I thought it was a, a great one to show plant people because the reason it's so orange is it's covered in pollen from Calstromia glandif uh, grandifloria, <laughs> grandiflora, which is the Arizona poppy. Um, another nectarless flower or very little nectar, which um, is usually wind pollinated, I believe, but the bees love the pollen. And they also, um, I wonder if they actually aid in outcrossing because of their habit of just getting covered in this pollen and then going flower to flower. It makes me think that even if uh, wind pollination is the main mode of pollination for these flowers, that maybe these bees are contributing something to um, the genetic diversity of these flowers. So I, I wanted to include that one. Um, and we also have some rare bees and some, some very endemic bees that I think are kind of special. One of them is Telethrix. And this is, uh, the species that we have here is Telethrix sumacrasti. 
but uh, the species that I have pictured here, you can see it uh, crawling out of a hibiscus flower. That's not <laughs> Tilithrix simicrassi, that is Tilithrix bombiformis. And I had to include its picture because I simply could not find an image of Tilithrix simicrassi. I'm sure there is one, but I, I hunted for quite some time. and <laughs> I did not find it. So it, it's pretty rare and pretty unique to our part of the world and to Mexico. Um, and, you know, a little bit more broadly throughout the Southwest, but it, it's concentrated here. And I, I have collected it in this part of the world. So we do have it. And it is a specialist on morning glories, Ipamia. Um, these bees are closely related to diadasia, the one that does the, the little chimneys and the aggregation. And Telethrix also does little chimneys called tumuli, but they're visually distinguishable from diadasia because uh, Telethrix has this habit of collecting water. So what they'll do is they'll land on water, like a water strider kind of, and they'll, they'll go back with water to where they're building their nest and they'll roll up mud balls and they kind of make a little clay structure. And you can actually see those mud balls on the outside of their, their little turret at the top of their nest. So you can identify if you found a nest of this bee and you could, you could look at it. Um, if you, there's a trick you can use if you're interested in this trick for, for finding bees when they come to their nest, uh, ask me afterwards and I'll tell you about it. But, um, I'm sure you would appreciate it and then let it go on its way and not, not kill it, right? I don't know. I, I wouldn't know if I could promise the same. Um, but it's a very, very cool local bee and very rare. And another rare local bee that we have here is little known enough that I'm not sure what plants it visits. Um, it's only here and in Mexico. It is a member of the Eucerini, which is the, the same group as, uh, well, I didn't mention Melisodes. It's, um, it's a common tribe, but this is the only species in the genus and it's only found here. And as you can tell, the only image of it that I could find was like a scan from an old book. So um, it's, it's a neat one. If you see it, let me know. <laughs> I wanna know more about this bee. Um, so that brings me to the, the part that's um, a little less pleasant. And I'm going to zoom through the part that I think that you, you are familiar with, that you've probably heard more times than you wanted to, which is the fact that bees and, and all sorts of things are declining. And we don't have good numbers from historical data about what's going on with individual species of native bees, because they're hard to find, they're hard to survey, it's hard to keep track of their populations. Museum collections sometimes have um, historical information that we can gather about bee populations of the past, but it's really hard to estimate abundance going back in time. And only now are we beginning to do these big surveys where we, we just collect everything and we measure what's there. So we don't know the status of a lot of populations, but we're working on fixing it. But the general trend that we can tell so far is that things are just in decline. And that's due to all the reasons that you think. Um, habitat degradation is the main one right now. And the, it's, the, it's the biggest cause of decline due to all of those agriculture, urbanization, pesticide, um, large scale changes that cause bees to lose their forage plants and their nest sites. Um, but I, I'm interested in climate change. And I'm thinking as the Southwest becomes hotter, drier, and more extreme, that that could become a bigger um, cause of decline. And it could also become one that's harder for us to reverse. So I'm interested in finding out which factors are actually going to be important threats to bees very soon. And um, without spending too much of our focus on that, I wanna switch over to what we can do to, to kind of reverse this pattern. And if right now the issue is habitat loss, well, there's a lot you can do. You can provide habitat. You can plant native flowers, which I'm sure a lot of you do. You can shop for sustainable groceries. There's a lot of consumer choices that you can make. Um, and on the climate change front, you can reduce fossil fuels and you can tell other people to do the same. Um, but to add habitat, 
I'll start with that. You can, um, you can provide habitat for bees that nest in cavities by putting uh, these, they're called bee hotels sometimes. You can put these in your yard and they really do host a lot of bees. Some people have had trouble getting them to be uh, inhabited. And I would recommend that you, you choose a sheltered location that's maybe under an overhang, maybe on a porch or under the eaves of your, your house or apartment on a balcony. Um, and these can be as fancy and artistic as you want, but they could also just be a, a tin can full of straws or um, probably not plastic, some kind of porous material. And I, I heard a really good idea last spring, um, which is to use a, a runda, if, if I'm saying that properly, the invasive grass that you can find in all the, the creek, the washes here. Um, and you can just cut them to a length that's suitable for you and cram them into some container and just put them outside. And bees will inhabit those and you'll be cleaning up this, this plant that's just overwhelming our washes these days. And you can put a pine cone in there too. I think that's just for decoration. <laughs> um, oh, but, the, but one thing I wanted to mention about this is that if you do this, choose a lot of different diameters of holes so that you have a diversity of bees that can utilize them. And I think you'll start seeing them inhabited, if not the first year, then maybe the second year. And you can just leave this alone. Um, some people are concerned about pests that might um, pests and pathogens that might get in the straws and kind of infect the bees. I think my sense is that because we're in such a dry climate, we don't have as much a problem with that as other people do. And I, I just leave mine alone. But if you wanted to be really vigilant, you could take those out every year and kind of clean them out and then put them back. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's necessary. Uh, a really important thing you can do to provide habitat and forage is to have smart gardening practices. So in addition to the bee hotels, I recommend if you can avoid a gravel yard and especially avoid plastic with gravel over it. I know that's popular in this part of the world and it looks really nice. But it's actually pretty high maintenance. <laughs> and I say that because I have it in my yard and I, I am always having to blow those little mesquite leaves out. But um, one thing you can do is kind of corral the gravel into one part of your yard and leave another area where you have leaf litter, you may have some areas of bare soil, and that's great nesting habitat for bees. And you can also, um, this group knows local plants really well, plant them and keep the invasive weeds out. So, you know, just pull them. Um, I like to pull them and leave the, the um, leaf litter lying around. And uh, another thing is to choose plants that don't have pesticide coatings on the seeds, which can end up in the flower tissue, end up in the nectar, and actually affect pollinators. So if you're getting seeds from places like Home Depot or Lowe's, unless it's marked organic, it could have this coating that could impact pollinators that you wouldn't even realize. I like to get seeds from some of the local places like Desert Survivors, um, Tohono Chul Park, uh, I have a list of them here later, but they, these places are great about having native plants that are really healthy and that don't have seed coatings. And there are also certain plants that are helpful for bees. Um, here's a, an image of some of them, and you can actually, I think this is a poster that you can buy. So you can find this image online. Um, you just have to, I'm, oops, I'm blocking my own view of the source of this with my zoom controls. So hopefully you can see where this came from. And I'll mention that um, sunflower is on this list. Sunflower is a plant that, I, I think that's helianthus. Um, it's a plant that bees forage on um, when they have pathogens. And it seems like they're self-medicating using sunflower nectar, which is not as nutritious as other nectars, but which has um, some chemicals that harm bees a little bit, but get rid of their pathogens. So they they choose to forage on that when they have pathogens. And it's really interesting. Um, so sunflowers are good forage. Here's my list of plant places. EcoGrow is um, not always native, but they are very knowledgeable. And then of course, uh, native seed search is, uh, is all about the native seeds and they're very responsible and knowledgeable as well. So I recommend all these places. Um, 
I'm going to skip this in the interest of time, but this is evidence that it really does make a difference to plant native plants and to create this habitat in, in the, um, the abundance of the number of bees that are in your area and hoverflies as well. Um, so I mentioned some consumer choices that you can make, and I, I encourage people to buy organic, to buy um, fair trade, shade grown things and support polyculture and kind of, you know, find out how things that you buy were farmed because that, you know, affects the market and makes a difference. And then there's a few places that I mentioned here. I don't know how many of these are still doing the same things that they were before the pandemic. Um, but the community supported or agriculture here in Tucson, um, the Tucson Village Farm is really fun, especially if you have kids or grandkids and you want to show them where their food comes from, they can pick it themselves. Uh, the powwow uh, produce thing, I, if you've done that before, it's really fun. They take the, the produce that was rejected from grocery stores because it's a little bit older, a little bit spottier, and they sell it for really cheap and you can get a ton of produce for like ten dollars and you can just make a salsa or something um and and it's uh, it's using food that would otherwise go to waste you can even just buy it and compost it and uh, i think it's a good thing that they're doing um and then of course you can reduce fossil fuels to have a longer term impact but i think one of the most important things to do is to keep telling people about this tell them some of the cool natural history stories about bees or show them, go out and find these bees in the wild. And there's a, this is a little Osmia bee that will actually build its nest inside of a snail shell. And I think that's adorable. So um, I wanted to <laughs> show that and end on that note. And I have a few more slides, but I think I'm out. Of, I, I saved those for the end in case I had time and I think I don't. So I, I'd like to um, take questions if there's time to, to do that, otherwise I can, I can show extra, but what do y'all think? I would say go ahead and, and finish your slides yeah. and, and we'll take questions. Um, we had some business at the beginning, so you have a little more time in your in your basket. Okay, if people have time, I just, this is stuff that I just, uh, I love to show because I'm just gonna be a nerd about it. But um, so we have, uh, I wanted to show you a few ways to find bees where if you, if you just, I know these things are all around us, but you never get the chance to see them, right? So some tricks for finding bees. And this is Melisodes. Um, they, in the summertime, they like to sleep inside of flowers. So if you're an early morning person or a late evening person, when the light is dim and certain flowers close their petals, you can kind of peek inside the petals and you might see sleeping bees. And it's, it's adorable, um, but it's also just a good way to find bees that do that behavior. And another, uh, this is this is Feralcia. Um, it's a great bee plant. This is also Melisodes, but these are all males. And you can tell because of their very long antennae that they're males, the males just have super long antennae. And what they're doing is they're sleeping. Um, so male bees don't build a nest while the females build a nest um, and provision and the males become adults, they go out into the world, they have no place, they, they have nowhere to go. So they'll kind of aggregate on a stem and they'll hang onto it with their mandibles and spend the night that way. So if you, if you find a good branch or a cluster of blades of grass or something where this is going on, you can check it night after night and those bees will keep returning to the same stem or a nearby stem. I've seen them on, uh, crepe myrtles, which I don't think are native, but uh, I've seen them on bare stems of desert willow. And they just, they'll just do that behavior. So if you spot them, you know, keep an eye out and you'll know what's going on. Um, also a really good way to, to capture them, but <laughs> I, you know, anyway, I'm not saying to kill them. So uh, Xenoglossa, this is a, a more widespread bee. And we have more of these here than other places do, but it's, I'm, I don't mean to imply that they are not present in other parts of North America because they are. But these are often called squash bees. Um, other parts of, the, of North America have more of a similar genus called Pethanapus, and they're, they're related, but um, they're, they're squash specialists that I, I believe in our part of the world could be found in the uh, 
Cucurbita fetida, the, the stinky gourd, which is, you know, can be found sprawling over bare patches of ground in mid elevation sites throughout our area. Um, these are bees that forage in the early part of the day. And because it's kind of, uh, it's like dawn, it's still kind of dark when they're foraging. They have huge eyes, including the light sensing eyes, the three little circle eyes that are at the top of their head, which are called ocelli. Um, they need to collect as much light as they can so that they can forage. And, and that's why they have that. And that's why it's also a good way to identify them. And they're seen nesting near the base of their, their food plant, which is squash. Um, and then they're also associated with mites, which um, they're not the only bees that are associated with mites. There are several bees that have kind of a, what seems to be a mutualistic relationship with mites and they have a little place to harbor mites on their body and the mites are doing something <laughs> for them. When I'm not sure what that is. I know in some other insects they might be cleaning, but I'm not sure what's going on here with these mites. Um, then there's, there's Eucera and we have uh, these several soft light orchids that have specialized attractants to get pollinated by different species of Eucera. Uh, I think that's, that's amazing. They, they are uh, doing deceptive, uh, I, uh, what, oh, I called it sexual deception. Um, these orchid flowers look like a bee. <laughs> so the males are going to mate with them and then they're pollinating, which is one of my favorite bee plant interactions that I have heard of. Um, and, oh, this is a video um, of Opuntia. And I wanted to, what I wanted to point out in this video, and hopefully, Hopefully it'll work. I know that sometimes the videos are choppy if I didn't optimize for a screen share, but um, you're going to see this bee fly out. And this is kind of aligned with the ideas about how to find bees by looking in flowers. Um, this bee flies out and you'll see the anthers of the flower are moving around and there's some beetles in there. But what I learned just this past year from Mary Price and Nick Wasser is that uh, Opuntia flowers actually have some active um, movement of the anthers that occurs after they're touched. So you can walk up to a prickly pear flower and stick your finger into the anthers and you'll see them moving around. And there, there were some hypotheses that this is improving the, the pollination by getting the anthers to touch or not touch parts of the body of whoever's visiting them. So I'll play this video and it's really short, but you can see it maybe. So here it goes. So that bee just took off, but in the upper center there, there was a, a, a motion that may have been from the beetle, but may have been just the anthers moving of their own accord, which I think is pretty amazing. Oh, there it goes again. That looks like diadasia to me, if I had to guess. So this, uh, this is another video and um, I, I narrate it myself in the video, but this was in the Santa Rita range, uh, not the experimental range, just the Santa Rita mountains near Whipple Observatory, uh, again, around 5,000 feet, 1,500 meters. And this is a flower of uh, Dazzlerian mulleri. This was during the dry, dry, hot part of the summer of 2020. <laughs> so I was amazed to see the diversity of bees on this plant. And I just, I'm psyched to share this whenever I can. So I'll play this video for you. So 
So hopefully the video looked clear for you, but even if it was skipping around, I think you could probably see just the incredible diversity on that one inflorescence. And I counted at least five species just at a glance. Um, and I think there were probably more. And I also saw a wasp that I didn't notice earlier. So seeing things like this out in the desert, that just makes my day. Oh, it, it replays apparently. So um, another group of bees and an interesting behavior that I didn't talk about earlier is leaf cutter bees. These are in the family Megachylidae, and there are actually several genera that, that do this behavior, but they, they will cut these circles out of leaves, which you may already be familiar with. You may have seen this in your yard, but they're carrying little leaf circles back to their nests, and they're going to um, form them into a kind of uh, what Steve Buckman likes to call a sleeping bag for their babies. And they're basically creating a tunnel similar to the other bees that I showed you where they, they do a cylinder and they provision it with pollen and they put an egg in there and then they, they somehow wall it off or, or make it secure. Um, and then the bee develops as a larva, as a pupa, and then as an adult without any additional care from the adult female that laid the egg. So that's, that's the general pattern that bees do. But the fact that these bees use cut leaves for that is, um, is just really interesting. And they'll sometimes use found cavities above ground, sometimes they'll nest in the ground, and sometimes they'll use cavities that were actually created by other bees. So on the image on the left here, this is a carpenter bee, Xylocopa nest, that was excavated out of a Dazilurian stalk. And then a leaf cutter bee came and added one of those little leaf uh, sleeping bags that's pieced together and put in there kind of like a cigar. So this is hollow and in the inside there is a bee. Um, over here on the right, <laughs> that video kind of played itself, but it was just a slow motion. Um, we'll do it again. That is a leaf cutter bee that's coming out of a, a hole in masonry that it's probably created itself. I'm assuming that it can pull grain by grain and, and uh, make a tunnel in masonry. And if you're familiar with the University of Arizona campus, this is actually a building called Forbes which is an older building that's right in the middle of campus. Um, and it's got the Rose Garden out in the, on the east side of it. Um, so the bees there forage for the leaves of roses and take them back to cavities that are either in the ground or in the side of the building itself. And I think that's an amazing behavior and even more amazing is that some of them actually don't use leaves, they use flower petals and they make their nests out of the petals of flowers, which I think is gorgeous and amazing. This image that I chose is Osmia avancetta, and that's a bee that lives in Turkey. But um, I'm told by a colleague, Victoria Luisi, that the um, Reed Park test garden, the, the rose test garden, has a species here that does the same thing, and she's seen them cut circles out of the flower petals there. Um, so I, I know it happens, but it you know, whether it's documented or not, I'm unsure. If anyone knows, let me know, because I want to find that little bee. Um, and I think that was all the additional things that I had. So um, thank you for, for viewing my presentation, and I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions that people might have. Oh, thank you, Catherine. That was just fascinating. Thank you. It's really, it's just... Thanks, Susie. Oh, amazing. And to, you know that all of the, all of these things are just going on. And of course, we have no idea. I guess we're going on with our day too, but they're all working hard on, on um, nest building and mating and pollen collecting. And it's just quite amazing. Well, there's a lot of um, questions in the chat, and I think I'm just going to um, start at the bottom. People thanking. Um, let's see. Oh, and oh. Diane, everyone years ago, someone established that at least a subset of leaves are useful in producing chemicals that reduce nest pathogens. You might have seen that. I'm, uh, I'm looking at this. A subset of leaves are useful in producing chemicals. Um, referring to the, uh, the leaf cutter bees, I think. 
And uh, actually the colleague that I mentioned is looking at the, the microbes that are brought into the nest from the leaves that are chosen, and whether um, the bees are choosing leaves to serve some microbial, um, to meet some need that they might have, or you know, if there's a, an evolved reason for doing what they do. So I think that's incredibly compelling. I also see, um, Elliot is saying that those are diadasia, not melisodes, and I think he's referring to the image with the glow mallow. Um, and I actually thought that those look like diadasia too, but the image I, I was looking at claimed they were melisodes. So I'm actually, I'm pretty interested to see that comment. Um, and then maybe this is a, I don't know that Coquilla tapis. I'm, I'm, I'm curious actually to talk to Elliot sometime maybe. Um, cool. Yeah. And then what time of the year should the bee hotels be cleaned out? I guess you wouldn't want to be cleaning out uh, larva and, you know, live bees. That's a good what point. What is the best way to clean them out? You, you wouldn't want to be cleaning them out in, um, like, if, first of all, if you're seeing bees coming and going from them, that means they're probably provisioning their nest and you don't want to just wipe out what they're doing. Um, I, I think with certain types of uh, megachylidae that are used like in agriculture, people will clean those out while they're overwintering as pupae. And uh, in that particular group of bees, they overwinter as pupae. And that's not universally true, but most bees are less active in the winter when there are fewer things flowering. Um, so they might be in some kind of quiescent life stage where it would be safe to kind of open up their nest and, and get them out. Um, so the thing is, if you, if you clean them out, there's, it, it would be hard to choose a time of year when they're just absent. So you would be most likely opening up their nest, taking out the bees that look like they're healthy, um, and then replacing those that are, you know, not moldy or dead, uh, and, and maybe throwing away any that look infected or whatever. So, um, I would say winter, but there's a, there's a resource through University of, I was gonna say Michigan, but now I'm wondering, I, I think it maybe is Minnesota. They have a great pamphlet on um, how to do that with the bees that are there. And I could link you to that if that's uh, something you're interested in. So I, I would say contact me if you want that information and I'll, I'll find it and send it to you. Is, is it necessary to clean them out? I don't think so. I know there are people who might argue with me on that. Um, I, I've left mine repeatedly and they've been okay. Some people um, are concerned that invasive wasps will inhabit the, the cavities. Um, and I can't say whether or not I've, I, I can't say definitively, definitively if that is a concern or not that I would have. Um, but yeah, I, I leave mine alone and they seem fine. They seem healthy and diverse to me. Okay. I, I actually think that in the northern and midwestern parts of our of our um, country, there are uh, there's just a lot higher humidity and moisture and and um, like snow and things. Cold cold water gets in and then things grow, <laughs> and I think we have less of an issue with that here. And then there's a question about the turrets. Mm -hmm. um, do the turrets accentuate air movement in and out of the nest? Via I don't, the, I, I don't, I don't know. know what the turrets do, actually. I think I may have read, I, th I think people have looked at that, um, but I'm not recalling what exactly the turrets are thought to be for. They're so just not sure. <laughs> That's a great question. Oh, and then some... Um, I guess these are some plant, again, this is from Elliot. So I really don't even know what to. <laughs> um, which, let's see. How to, let's see, at 748. 748, do the turrets, oh, what time? Of, I guess here. plants, because. Oh, I see. Plants. Yeah, so basically, okay. Oh, wow, oh. cool. Lorea, <laughs> so that's. That was to your slide about um, not knowing what 
the the that particular bee you were talking about foraged on. It was awesome. not. Yeah. I, I Elliot is like hitting home runs all the time. That's awesome. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, I didn't know that that people knew what that. I did check discoverlife.org for that species, but I didn't see all that info. So that's really cool. Thanks, Elliot, if you're still here. Catherine, if you're willing to get emails from people like Elliot, and if you're willing to put your email in the chat, then at least he would have it. Or you could send it to him, him individually. Um, OK, I'll, I'm putting my email in the chat. Um, yeah, anyone can feel free to email me if you'd like to. Okay. And then, and is there an authoritative list that provides information on which plants offer pollen, which offer nectar, and which offer both? Um, if there's a plant list that has that information? Mm -hmm. That I don't know. That I, I would uh, redirect that question to the group if anybody has insight on that question. Ooh, Spadefoot Nursery. I just saw that. Yeah, that's a good resource for native plants. Yeah, the Maricopa Native um, Seed Library, that's something that's been started in the last couple of years, which is very cool. Uh, people uh, have been bitten and stung by sweat bees. Um, yeah, oh, and then this was another question about the little tiny Mat like flowers, euphorbias. Ah, that's what I was. I, I was thinking maybe it was euphorbia, and I didn't want to say that because I was like, I bet that's wrong. <laughs> but thank you for confirming that it's euphorbia. And that's exactly what it was that I was thinking of. They have these tiny white flowers, and they're really low to the ground, and um, like lazia glossum are just in there. Um, the, the way that I learned to collect the lazia glossum, um, this was from Jerry Rosen, who really knows his stuff. From the American uh, Museum of Natural History, and he goes he goes to Portal uh, at that research station. So he was leading the bee course, and he says, "What you have to do is you, you use a really big net with a large diameter. You go around to the um, euphorbia, and you're you're like sweeping all over the place, and and you don't even see anything, but you're just sweeping the net like you're gonna catch something. And then you stick your whole head in the net, and you just like look around." <laughs> <laughs> so that's, how he, that's how he goes about collecting those little tiny bees. <laughs> <laughs> but then how do you get them out of the net? Oh, well, and so he's got uh, these little vials with cotton balls down in the bottom that are soaked in cyanide. And oh. he goes around with the vial and he just scoops up everything because he's got his head. And I didn't mention he also has his... Uh, <laughs> his arms inside the net and he's just like oh. putting things into the tube and it and they all just die as soon as they contact that that gas in the tube um so yeah it's just a matter of cornering <laughs> them in the net that's funny well there are a couple more questions or information here on the diadasia okay And, and wasps that are predators. It looks like Diane, is this Diane Kelly? Diane, she seems to be pretty, pretty up on wasps. This is Diane Davidson from Portal. Oh. oh, okay. Well, it's great that you could join us. My is, <laughs> is this, um, the Diane that was asking about the diadesia that visit Opuntia and Gilmania early in the morning? Yes. Okay. So the two cacti, um, you say they co-occur in the desert and the diadesia are choosing one in the morning and the other in the afternoon when it's hot? Yeah, they're right in mid midday. So you're thinking that- um, okay. They can't oh, in midday, yeah. Why, I wonder why they prefer one over the other when it's hot. I don't think that's how, the Anglomania uh, opens its flowers early. Acanthocarpa opens its flowers in the heat of the day. I see, so it's when the flower is available. Yeah. 
Uh, huh. But it just struck me. We, I, I used to take field classes out the Sonoran Desert, and we, we just always speculated that it would be helpful for one of these cacti to help, have help maintaining the bee population by the other cacti also producing uh, resources for the bees. Oh, and, that would be a really cool, like... They, they co-occur over huge areas of the desert. And, and one could speculate that if you look biogeographically where one species dropped out, maybe the other one wouldn't do so well. Maybe Did, that's why they're always together. Are they always together? Do they ever not overlap? I don't know. I, I, was, I was visiting from Utah. So you're in Arizona and you should, you should have a look at it for that. That's an interesting question. Thanks for telling me about that. That sounds like a good uh, research project for a student. <laughs> I'm going to save the chat so I can remember what all these comments are. Yeah. And then there's a, this is something I wondered about too, when we were looking at the drawing of the bumblebees. Um, I see five eggs in the cell. Does only one develop into a larva? And then Elliot said they usually hatch and emerge one after the other. Um, I'm, is Elliot still here? Because I'm wondering if he meant the eggs hatch one after the other, or if he meant that the pupae turn into adults one after the other. Oh, Elliot's here. Um, Elliot, do you? I don't know if you'd be willing to weigh in on that. I'm curious what you meant. He may not, uh, may not want to unmute, or he may have gone. Yeah. Oh wait, no, I maybe I just need to give him a chance. Wait, how about now? Yeah, yeah. I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, I I uh, I'm not certain for bumblebees, but I know for I've heard for like uh, Mega Kylie and Osmia that it'd be the egg in the front of the tube would hatch first and then the one after that. And so it wouldn't just be one egg out of five would would survive to adulthood, but they wouldn't all emerge at the same time. Gotcha, gotcha. That makes sense. But, um, I, but I saw that too. And, and it seems odd that if, if typically the eggs are sequestered in a chamber of their own or in a, in a pot of their own, this was a bombus. Mm -hmm. Would they lay multiple eggs in the same in the same wax chamber, or, or would that not be? I mean, if they're all laid simultaneously, then there's like unlikely to be a time differential in their development, unless they're influencing each other in some fashion. I actually didn't. Uh, I wasn't aware of them having several eggs in one little, you know, cell. This um, is the illustration that you showed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I know what you're referring to, but I, I guess I haven't heard that as a, a detail of the Bombas life history story, but that doesn't mean that that's not how it happens. Um, I just didn't, I didn't know about that. So I'm not sure why there are several eggs there in the image. Um, I know that like in the case of, uh, Elliot mentioned the mega that, and, and actually Xylocopa do something somewhat similar where they they have to emerge at different times, but the eggs are laid in the opposite sequence from how they have to emerge. So they do have a sequential emergence pattern, but um, that makes sense because they're in a linear tube, which Bombus is not. And I agree with Lynn that it's unusual to have um, like a, a single cell. I, I usually think of as a home for one baby. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know of cases where there are several larvae developing within a cell, but that doesn't mean that that isn't something that happens. How do Bombus construct their cells? Is that uh, from grass or soil or a mix? Bombus actually, um, they're, they're reusing a cavity, but for the cells, I think they produce wax just like a honeybee would. I, I think it's something they exude from their body rather than something they collect. That's my understanding also. Okay. Yeah, I, I feel like all these things, I, I've assumed these things and I hope I'm right about that. I want to fact check myself, but um, <laughs> that, was, that was what I believed at least. Okay. 
Well, I think we're probably about to um, leave, ready to finish up. I will, um, Susan Oates did mention that Spadefoot Nursery lists relationships between insects and birds and plants in many of their descriptions, which is good. Nice. So, um, I'm not sure there is a comprehensive list that I'm aware of that lists plants by species and specifies whether they produce pollen, whether they produce, whether nectar whether they produce both i mean i think you would that would be difficult to compile because there are lots of plant species and there may be variations throughout the range at least in terms of quantity of nectar but i don't know of a comprehensive list that gives those data yeah and oils that's so interesting that they collect oils too i never realized that yeah, that they're collecting plant oils and then repurposing them for their yeah. own yeah. mating strategies and things. Yeah, that's, I love that. Okay. Well, thank you, um, Catherine. It's been a really fascinating presentation. Well, thank you for having me and thanks to everyone who came and I, I've enjoyed it a lot. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation. And I made a copy of most of the chat, so I will send that on to you, Catherine, just so you can peruse it if you didn't get a chance to copy it, so. Oh, that's great, thank you. Okay, um, so I, I think that probably ends our um, presentation tonight. Our program is, is ended and I made some announcements earlier, but um, thank you all for attending and we will see you in January, on January 13th. Have yes. a happy holiday to everyone and stay safe. Good night. Bye-bye.